Jobs, jobs, jobs. The unemployment rate is at the lowest point it has been since 2001. Breaking news here, the economy grew 4.1% in the second quarter. Another month of strong numbers, seven and a half years now of job creation, that is a record stretch. You get up every day and you play by the rules. You're investing in your families. You're investing in working very, very hard. But workers are not gaining their fair share of an ever-expanding economic pie. And why is that? People all across the country working in jobs once considered middle class, but now living far below a middle class lifestyle. A majority of U.S. workers have experienced a decade of flat wages. While income inequality has shot up by as much as 50%. People just are hustling because they don't have a job, they don't have a job that make ends meet, and they have to hustle to put food on the table. The number of part-time jobs is soaring. Are we redefining work here? This is the future of work, Jim. We are at a turning point. Good jobs are not being created and are disappearing. It's a survival economy, particularly for low-income people who are systematically excluded from the labor market. The workers who make up the informal economy are the most marginalized workers in the country. They are people of color, they are immigrants, they are women. This inequality that we've been experiencing, this insecurity is related to informal labor, is related to the fact that workers are not being protected the way they should. What we've seen in the last 40 years is perhaps the greatest shift of income and wealth from the broad middle class to very wealthy people in this country. And it wasn't by accident. The Dow tumbled more than 500 points after two pillars of the street tumbled over the weekend. So in just six months, three of the five biggest independent firms on Wall Street have now disappeared. We are in the midst of a serious financial crisis. The news from Wall Street has shaken the American people's faith in our economy. When you blow up the economy like we did, many people lost their homes, let alone massive unemployment. And so now, you know, we're 10 years out from that and they're trying to just get back what they lost. At the end of the day, America is an idea. It's an idea about how do you construct a democratic society. The social contract that most of us have in our mind, the bargain that we make with society as a whole, says that we should be able to access relatively stable, relatively secure, employment, that basic labor standards, such as minimum wages, health and safety on the job, the right to overtime pay when we work more than 40 hours. We've never actually lived up to the idea of a social contract. We've exalted it in our documents, but the reality of its application in the world of policy and law has fallen far short. If you look at undocumented immigrants that are facing challenges in the labor market, African-American or Latino communities that have high rates of underemployment and unemployment, women whose work has been devalued historically, you see these populations disproportionately within the informal economy. The informal economy for many years was regarded as something that occurred elsewhere. It was a phenomenon of developing economies. The view was that the United States had progressed beyond this. The early work on the informal economy was really focusing on a sector that was supposed to disappear over time as economies modernized. What we now realize is that this is not happening, this has not been happening, and in fact, the informal economy seemed to have grown. I think of the informal economy as a political economic 
and social space that has been created by the law and the law's exclusions. We have a whole plethora of employment and labor law protections, and there are a growing number of workers who are not covered by those protections, and those people are informal workers. So in the case of a day laborer who's working in the construction industry, they'll be hired off the books, or you take the case of a domestic worker who may have a verbal agreement with their employer. It could be braiding hair in your apartment. It could be washing cars in the neighborhood. These are forms of the economy that are hiding in plain sight, but we often don't link these together. We don't see the day laborer, the domestic worker, the street vendor as inhabiting a similar set of employment relations. And so we often don't make these connections. And for that reason, we don't understand how vast the informal economy actually is. When analysts try to identify when we started to really notice a reemergence in the informal economy, many point back to a period in the late 1970s, early 1980s, where we saw a number of, of policy changes within the economy. First and foremost was the beginning of a concerted assault on labor unions. Ronald Reagan fired 12,000 air traffic controllers after they violated federal laws against striking. I must tell those who failed to report for duty this morning, they are in violation of the law, and if they do not report for work within 48 hours, they have forfeited their jobs and will be terminated. It's happening all over the country. Union membership is down, and more and more industries are beginning to unravel and dismantle some of the union contracts that were fashioned during the healthier years of the labor movement. At that point, we start to see significant erosion of employment conditions, the minimum wage. We see that the role of the government is being redefined. Instead of being about providing protection for workers, the role of the government becomes to attract investors, to promote businesses, to stimulate the economy. You don't want government to interfere with market activity. The free market should rule. The free market enables people to buy in the cheapest market around the world. If they fail, they bear the cost. If they succeed, they get the benefit. Neoliberalism is essentially an ideological commitment to the free market, to the idea that the market governs best. Government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem. Neoliberalism is a change in ideology regarding the role of the state. And globalization is something that happens in parallel. And in the 1970s, we entered a new era of globalization. We're losing to the competition. We are only strong when we are willing to compete with the whole world. General Motors confirmed it today. It is going to close plants employing almost 30,000 workers. Ford alone has laid off 50,000 men. One in nine men and women is out of work. What's the situation in Detroit like at the moment? It don't look good. It doesn't look good at all. Many people talk of globalization as if it came from on high somehow. Uh, no, this was a policy. We could have done globalization differently. We pitted American manufacturing workers against some of the lowest wage, lowest standard workforces all over the world. Around the same time, we also saw uh, efforts to reform welfare and to make it more restrictive unemployment insurance as well to make it more restrictive. When I ran for president four years ago, I pledged to end welfare as we know it. I have worked very hard for four years to do just that. A lot of the supports that were the basis of sustained economic growth in the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s really begin to be eliminated. And so informality grows up in that space. Neoliberalism became popularized by Reagan but it continued with all the president that followed. And it has become such a dominant ideology that presidents on both sides of the political divide adopt that premise. We've always tried to have a large supply of cheap, affordable, disposable labor to run the economy, to make the economy work the industrial era, a time in this country where there was rapacious capitalism, 
and labor exploited to the extent that people were dying on the job. There was no regulation, there was no 40 hour a week, and it's not until the late 1800 or so that some social reformers started demanding that the government begin to protect workers. When labor was in its ascendancy and the rights of workers was being kind of enshrined in laws, during that same period of time, African Americans were excluded from many of the major labor movements. It's only when we started regulating labor and protecting labor that we started seeing this official sort of bifurcation between the formal and the informal economy. It's really not until the New Deal, which occurred in the midst of the Great Depression, that we started seeing more systematic regulation of work in the United States. Of course we will continue to seek to improve working conditions for the workers of America, to reduce hours that are overlong, to increase wages that spell starvation. Roosevelt passed a number of laws that we now refer to as the New Deal. The kind of security the American people want is a fair chance in life. The people of the United States have joined together in a great national program of protection for the common welfare. What we did in America after the war, it was really we're all in this together. That had a lot to do with building the broad middle class post-World War II in this country. Workers could get a better, a fairer playing field, but we were still leaving people behind then. And so as the country moved into this golden age, there were millions of families who were left behind. The systematic dislocation of people of color from the labor force. What that has done is it's driven people underground. We have to be very concerned because we haven't learned the lessons of our first experience of globalization. We didn't learn the lessons in the ways in which human dignity were violated that is happening across our communities through informal labor, through formal labor, through the erosion of worker rights, through the intersections of race and capitalism. We are at this moment where our economy is changing quickly. We're really seeing a new kind of work becoming the new norms, but that's why it's important to pay attention to the informalization of the economy. City Rising is made possible in part by the California Endowment.